am I? Here I am. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to How to Craft a Successful Romance with Margot Derue. My name is Taryn Edwards and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. Um, this event is held in partnership with the San Francisco Writers Conference, uh, with whom we work closely to provide learning experiences for writers. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Mechanics Institute, we are an independent membership organization <clears throat> located in downtown San Francisco that houses a wonderful library, the oldest in fact designed to serve the general public, not just those of you who wield wrenches. Um, we also are a cultural event center and a world renowned chess club that is the oldest in the United States. Right now, due to the pandemic, many of our events are virtual, but we are slowly transitioning to in-person events. Um, and our library is now open to members five, day, five days a week. Um, I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It is only $120 a year. And with that, you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area that happily is starting up again. Um, our speaker today is Margot DeRoe, who is the author of The Lost Diary of Venice. Before turning to fiction, she worked in Silicon Valley as a strategic consultant. To purchase her novel and support independent booksellers, uh, please consider going to our favorite bookstore, which is Alexander Book Company on Third Street, or you can visit bookshop.org and order it. Um, thank you, Margot, for coming out to uh, share with us your knowledge about how to craft a successful romance. I think all of us are eager to hear more about that. Thanks for having me. Um, I appreciate it. And thanks for spending your, your lunch hour with me, everyone. Um, I am gonna try to share my screen now. And... Uh, you can let me know if that is that everyone can see see the visual. Yeah, I guess you're all muted. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm assuming it's working. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, thank you for the introduction, Taryn, and um, just a little bit of background. I'm represented by ICM. Um, my debut came out. Uh, the best year to debut a book, um, <laughs> which is actually, I'm joking, but um, it came out with Valentine uh, Penguin Random House. It's an indie next pick um, and it's out now in paperback. Um, I, the impetus for me doing this is, I'm assuming that everyone here is either um, working on something or maybe has a, a, you know, a seed of an idea and wants to explore the possibility. I'm assuming you're all writers and you're all um, in the trenches. And um, for me, I didn't come to writing with an MFA background. And so I did have to do a lot of research and, um, uh, and study to make sure that the structure of my book worked. And so the impetus for this presentation is, is just to share what I learned and what was helpful to me um, in the hopes that it might also be of service to you. Um, and so that's my goal here. And I hope that uh, what we cover today is is useful to you in some way. Um, a quick snapshot of what I'm hoping to cover um, is a little bit about the romance reader and then puzzle pieces, layers, the threads, whatever metaphor you want to use, but the different um, pieces of your book that will be woven together to make something that's um, structurally sound and satisfying for the romance reader. So we'll talk about subgenres um, and your character's motivations, settings, familiar tropes, um, I dig, dig into characterization a little bit, the scenes that your reader might expect, common conventions, and then we'll touch on, no pun intended, but we'll touch on intimacy, um, and then hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. So, 
I hope that sounds good. It's a little weird. I know you're all muted, so it's a little weird to be speaking to a, a silent audience, but um, I hope that sounds good to everyone. And if you, I think we have a chat feature if folks want to have notes in there. Is, yes, is and just to break in, um, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat space and um, we'll get to it at an appropriate time or at the end. So fear not, your questions will all be answered. Um, and I, I packed quite a bit in, so I'm gonna try to, try to be zippy. Um, so let's start with what makes a romance. Um, there's two basic elements that comprise a, a true romance novel, which is obviously that it's a central love story. You can be, um, aliens fighting a galactic war, but as long as the aliens are falling in love and that their, their relationship is the central piece um, and focus of the story, you've got yourself a love story. Um, and the other thing that is typical and expected is that there'll be an emotionally satisfying and usually optimistic ending. Um, we want to see, you know, if these characters have really struggled to be together throughout the whole book, the reader really, you know, they want a happy ending, they want to see them rewarded for their emotional risk. And it also kind of creates a little bit of a sense of, of justice. Um, romance novel formats. There's usually two formats, a uh, series or like a category romance. Um, and these will be numbered sequentially and come out, you know, usually at pretty regular intervals. And you'll see these from like Harlequin or Silhouette. And then you have your single title romances, which are um, standalone, usually released in hardback first um, and not necessarily part of, an, of a numbered sequence. So from a publishing standpoint, that's sort of how how things are organized. Um, who's going to be reading your book? This is useful and kind of interesting for me. This is all data from um, the Romance Writers Association. Um, it's a, a few years old, so we are seeing some shifts, but um, I trust this data because it was done from a pretty large survey. Um, demographic wise, primarily a female re uh, readership and the average age is specifically 35 to 39. Um, I think that's, you know, emphasis on average there, but you're gonna have a lot of moms. You're gonna have a lot of women who are potentially in marriages already in relationships reading this, these books. Um, when we get into the ethnicity of the reader, this is where we're seeing some great shifts. Um, you know, publishing has not been as diverse as it could be, and that's changing. And as more diverse offerings are um, hitting the market, we're seeing the readership change. So, a lot of the the the, demogra the a lot of the statistics here, I think, might be influenced by um, by what was being published. And you know, I, we're fortunately seeing a lot more voices being published, and hopefully we'll be seeing a lot more diversity in um, the executive level of publishing as well. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Um, the same goes for sexual orientation of the reader. Um, a lot of what was being put out to the market was um, heterosexual romances, and we're seeing a lot more diversity of offerings. And so you're gonna see readership expanding as well. And for me, this is really exciting. Um, these are new new areas of the market. And I think there's a really a hunger um, on the part of the reader for more diverse stories, um, a wider range of stories. When it comes to reading habits though, the, the most frequent readers are gonna be a little bit younger um, and they still are reading print. Um, we are seeing, you know, obviously tablet audiobook, but print is still really, really strong. And um, the one thing that I do want to say about romance is that romance pairs so well with other genres. And we're going to get into this. But romance, you can link romance with anything else. My book is um, historical, historical fiction romance. It's squarely at that intersection. And um, romantic suspense is hugely popular. So if you're at, you know, you, you, you don't have an idea yet, you're thinking about an idea, I might suggest romantic suspense. Um, it's very, very popular as is um, historical romance. 
and, and more erotic romance. Um, your younger readers, we see young, if you're looking to do a YA story, younger readers have been loving paranormal romance. And we'll dig into the, uh, the definition of that as well. Let's see, there we go, here we go. And how is it changing? Um, again, we're seeing more diversity in the readership as more diverse offerings are coming um, and more men reading romance, which I'm all for. We have a nice selection of photos here. <laughs> um, more people listening to audiobooks, um, and YA is just huge. And as to be expected, extreme engagement on social media, willing to try new authors um, and shop from different types of online, online retailers. So that's a really quick look at who your reader might be. And it's just something to bear in mind as you start putting your story together. So let's dig into what are the pieces of the story? What's gonna create a strong structure for you? Um, the first thing is identifying your subgenre. Romance is a huge umbrella term. And I think it's really helpful to know what the various subgenres are um, whether you've already identified what category you're in or whether you're choosing it, getting crystal clear on where your book fits really, really helps you, especially when you go trying to look for an agent, trying to, trying to get published. Um, having that clarity is, is hugely helpful. So let's just go through these real quick. Um, contemporary romance tends to go from 1950 to the present. Um, and it's often in the time that the author is writing. So, you know, if you're wanting something with, um, you know, a, a uh, empowered heroine who doesn't fit the beauty standards, um, a contemporary romance might be a really great fit for you. Your heroine's gonna have um, a lot more possibility than she would have had in a more repressive setting. Uh, historical romance is anything that is set prior to 1950. Um, I'm going to be really honest and say that World War II is probably the most popular time period right now. There's been a huge, uh, huge demand for World War II novels. Um, it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. It might be kind of at the tail end, but it's still a really strong, um, a really strong part of the market. And if you do a World War II historical romance, you will have almost like a built-in readership because there are definitely people who that's their interest and that's what they buy. And they're looking for the next book that's coming out. That's the World War II book. Same with the Regency romance. Regency romance specifically is also really popular. And so that does have a little bit of a built-in readership. Um, and that, you know, you think of uh, Jane Austen too there. Um, erotic romance. This is where, you know, obviously the, the sexuality is, is front and center, often pretty explicit, and it's part of the love story. Uh, paranormal romance, um, sometimes called speculative romance. This is sci-fi meets romance. Um, you have fantasy worlds, you have, you know, the paranormal of science fiction. And this is again, really, really popular with younger readers. So if you're doing a YA romance, I would encourage you to kind of look at this subgenre. Um, the one note I would say to keep in mind here is that if you're doing extreme world building, just remember that the world building is the backdrop for the romance and keep, keep that love story front and center. Um, romance with spiritual elements, again, huge built-in readership. Christian romances are very popular and you have readers looking for the next Christian romance coming out. And this is where you're going to see, you know, the counterpoint to erotic romance. The, the hottest thing in, in a romance with spiritual element might be just, you know, a kiss. Everything might be leading up to that moment of intimacy and, and it's kind of chaste, but it can still be really passionate. Um, uh, you know, Twilight was written by a Mormon, and I think those first books were were pretty tame, but still very passionate. Um, romantic suspense is is huge as well. This is where the the mystery or the thriller is a huge part of the plot, and then YA. Um, 
why it is just that the main characters are are younger and um I would really recommend if you're doing YA um, to spend time with young people. I think one of the biggest issues with YA is that the language doesn't match how young people speak or the behaviors aren't matching how young people speak. So if you're doing a YA romance, try to get um, young beta readers if you can and try to be as authentic as you can to what young people are going through today. Oop. Um, Another way of categorizing your, your love story is really identifying what is the motivation behind the relationship? What is driving, um, what is driving this key love story? And it typically falls into these three big buckets. This is from something called the story grid. I have, I'm going to share a bunch of resources at the end. Um, and I, really like the story grid uh, workbook um, and I'll, I'll share that. Um, I just wanna make sure I'm kind of citing where some of this is from so that you can dig into it more if it is helpful. Um, and so the three big buckets, you have obsession, right? Um, and this is obsession to the point of life or death often. So you see Romeo and Juliet here. Um, it's an overwhelming and intoxicating passion for this other person and these obsession love stories can sometimes be cautionary, cautionary tales. Um, they don't typically progress beyond that desire and sometimes they can end in death, again, like Romeo and Juliet. Um, and The Great Gatsby is another really good example of the obsession love story. Then you have the courtship where you're driving completely towards commitment. Pride and Prejudice is sort of the gold standard here. And I'm gonna, refer back to Pride and Prejudice because it's such a great structural example of um, kind of a bread and butter romance. Um, everything is driving towards marriage, towards commitment. And then you also have the marriage love story where they're already in a relationship. They've already committed, um, but something has happened. There's usually a negative inciting incident here. Somebody cheated. Um, you know, something else occurred to where the marriage and the intimacy are threatened and they need to figure out, are we staying together? And that's the, the, the psychological driver behind this story. So as I'm going through, I'm hoping that you can kind of, if you already have a story in the works, you can start to figure out, okay, where, how am I categorizing this? How does this fit? And if you, if you're just putting the pieces together, these are all things to, to keep in mind and, and, and kind of guideposts. Um, so I would say that setting is so hugely important to a romance story because romance is so often in series or at least sequels, trilogies, um, readers love to escape into romances and if you have a successful romance your editor your agent is going to say let's keep exploring this space um and so you want to make sure that the setting that you choose is one that that you and your reader are going to want to return to um you know you want to <laughs> it's important that you want to keep writing in this world too um so this is the scottish highlands from outlander uh as, as an example of that. Um, and another, another note is that if you have a really rich cast of characters in your romance, um, you can always explore the relationships of those, of those si secondary characters in the next book that you write. So it's the same, the same setting, um, it's just a development of it. So, you, you know, if you, you're doing a YA, you know, maybe it's, I keep thinking of Gilmore Girls, right? Where it's like this super cozy setting and there's excuses for the characters to bump into each other in the library, in the bookstore. Um, historical romance, you know, I would love to spend several books in 1950s Paris. Um, or, you know, again, World War II is also really, really popular. So the setting um, can really set you up for kind of long-term success. Just something to, to bear in mind. Um, and then I really want to talk about the tropes. Um, these are huge, huge parts of the genre and um, your readers are going to expect them. They're going to be familiar with them 
and it, you you don't have to um it's it's just so helpful to know which tropes you're working with you can subvert them you can color outside the lines absolutely but it's nice to know what lines you're coloring outside of um and it also really is i think and uh, your readers it, it helps your readers to dive right into the story if if you're using some of these tropes that they've come to kind of know and love and expect. Um, your most common one, the one that you're going to see really in everything is, is the love triangle. Um, at minimum, the rival, right? And part of the reason why readers love the love triangle is because they like to, you know, they like to figure out which relationship they are rooting for. Um, is she going to go with him or him? Your reader, you know, loves to sort of assess and evaluate and judge which which partner your main protagonist should choose. Um, it's really fun for them, and they get to play matchmaker. Um, Hunger Games, I think, is a pretty good, re more recent example of this. Um, secret billionaire, right? Someone's tired of their their lifestyle. They run out in disguise, and um, they meet someone and fall in love, and then it's you know, it's a little more complicated than than the just meet cute story. Um, I think of Crazy Rich Asian, Asians here, um, where he wasn't necessarily a secret billionaire, but she just had no idea what his world was really like. And that provided such a fun backdrop and really great obstacles. Um, friends to lovers. Um, this is not a book, but I always think of Ross and Rachel and friends, but just the idea that they've known each other and now they, um, they've they already bonded and now something has changed and they are shifting and the, the book can explore that shift. Um, I think uh, Eleanor and Park was a good example of this. Um, the stuck together is a really common trope and it can be paired with any of these other tropes. Um, whether they are snowed in at a cabin, whether they are um, you know, forced to work together, forced to go on a road trip, maybe they're even in an arranged marriage. Um, however it happens, the, the, the pair are stuck together and they have to work through things. This stuck together trope is really often paired with the enemies to lovers. Um, this is a, the Pride and Prejudice is a perfect example of this enemies to lovers. Um, and it's where, um, you know, two people, they hate each other and they kind of have to overcome their differences or overcome their own internal conflict. And then they find out that they're just made for each other. Um, the Taming of the Shrew by Shakespeare is also a, a wonderful example of this. And then Forbidden Love. Um, no matter whether it's you know forbidden because of politics or one of them's a vampire, you know, whatever the reason, the two characters that have really strong feelings for each other are um, it's verboten and it creates immediate tension and um, a, a dynamism. Uh, I think the the notebook is also a good example of that one. And just a few more, um, the second chance. This is the, the trope that will usually be paired with the, the, the mo intimacy motivation driver. So um, potentially they're in a, a marriage and they have to come back to each other. Um, you know, they, they broke up 10 years ago and now they're, they're rekindling something. Um, and then you have soulmates. Here I have uh, the Princess Bride, one of my favorites. Um, and these are meant to be together, but they're you know huge obstacle, whatever that obstacle needs to be. And then finally, the fake relationship. Um, I think uh, to all the boys I've loved before was a good example of this one. They're they're pretending they're in love to get out of an awkward situation, or um, they you know they are pretending a marriage for a green card, something. They're creating a fake relationship. This again intertwines with the stuck together trope, right? Um, so you can see how these things sort of start to layer on top of each other and work together. And that's why it's so important to go and map out your story and see, you know, what is working together, what is linking up. Um, and then before we go into the 
um, scenes and conventions, I'm, I'm saying develop your characters first. So we've talked about setting, we've talked about tropes, we've talked about the, the world that your character is inhabiting and the structure of it. And now before we talk about the action, this is where you really want to know your character inside and out because all of the action should be um, compelled by who, who that character is and how they would behave. So I think it's great to, you know, just on, on paper, map everything out in terms of, of the structure that your characters are working in. But before you go through the whole plot, please pause, take a second, make sure that you really know your characters because then you can always be quizzing yourself the whole way through. Is this what he or she would do? He, she, or they, right? Is this how this person would behave? And they can kind of lead you, lead you down the path themselves. Um, but when it comes to developing your characters, uh, you're always asking the question is, do I, would I want to read about this person? Is this person interesting to me? Um, Donald Mass has a wonderful workbook on characterization that I'll share at the very end. Um, but these are some of the bullets that you can hold up against the characters that you're developing. Um, we say quality of character. This is often called your character's strength right? Um, so we read fiction, not just to see ourselves, but also to imagine ourselves as we might be, right? Um, it can often take the whole book for your character to understand their own qualities, their strengths. Um, but that journey is the one that we really love to go along with as readers. And so strength can be a lot of different things for different people. Um, outspokenness, loyalty, perseverance, cunning, in a romance, it can also often be um, their emotional depth, their capacity for vulnerability. That reads to your reader as that character's true strength. Um, but there's usually always inner conflict. Uh, you know, no one wants to, we hate the characters who have everything figured out, right? We envy them or we're bored by them, but we're not in love with them. Um, and so we do want some sort of inner conflict because that is what allows your character to change over time to transform. And that transformation is where you get the satisfaction. Um, so the plot conflict plus the inner conflict is what equals that transformation and that character's arc. And so the one note I would have here is that you can have a really dark character, you can have a, a conflicted character, but readers don't tend to be super patient with um, willful self-destruction. So the character has to have some, some sympathetic qualities and they have to seem to want in some way to get over this inner conflict. Um, and in romance in particular, this inner conflict is usually what manifests as the obstacle to the relationship. So their inner conflict can be maybe a past experience that left them heartbroken, that left them closed off, and they have to get over that to open themselves up to love again. Um, and, and then that provides a really nice um, moment of tension for the relationship. And then these two sides of the coin, which are self-regard and humor, um, in a romance, the characters don't dismiss their experiences. They are um, appreciating the depth of what's happening to them. They're considering events. They're considering their own responses to these events. They're taking themselves seriously. And that allows us to, as readers, to really follow along with their arc. But if you take yourself super seriously, you have to have something that kind of counterbalances that. So that's usually a sense of humor or a wit or a spontaneity or something light. And so when you're looking at your main character, um, I mean, how, how is that balance falling with them? Um, and then usually forgiveness and self-sacrifice come up in, in a romance relationship. Again, I think of Pride and Prejudice where Darcy helps the Bennets without any hope of, of getting with, you know, getting to marry Elizabeth. He's just sacrificing um, for their greater good. And that is always, you know, um, the reader always loves those moments um, in the characterization. And then apply the same principles to your antagonist, whoever your rival is, um, 
you know, if you give them these qualities as well and these aspects, they'll be really compelling. They'll be really complex and it'll be um, really exciting for your reader to try to understand that antagonist. And usually villains also have their own sense of morality and justice. It's really twisted. It can be very twisted, but they usually are have, a, have that sense of, of their own type of justice, their own, own breed. So now let's dig into these expected scenes. And again, this is from the story grid, which I just, I love, but honestly, these expected scenes are, you're gonna find this wherever you do your research. These are, are just the really common ones. Um, and I would really invite you to map out whatever you're working on, go and, and find where are these moments. They don't necessarily have to be in this order, right? Your first kiss or intimate connection can be when they reunite, can be, you know, even when they break up maybe. So they don't have to be in this order, but you're gonna find all of these must have scenes in any really great romance. And so go through your work, see where you can map these out. Um, so obviously there's a, a meeting, there's an inciting incident, they get together somehow. Um, there's a first kiss, there's that first intimate connection, a confession of love, and then there's usually something that breaks them apart. So Pride and Prejudice is the gold standard because it's so clear to, it's, it's, these beats are so clear in that story. Um, the confession of love, the breakup, and then that proof of love. That proof of love is usually linking up with that element of um, forgiveness or self-sacrifice that we talked about. Um, they do something to show how much they care. And that usually leads to the lovers coming back together. So however, however, whatever order, map these out, see, see where it's at. And then if you don't believe me, go through all of your favorite romance stories and you're gonna find these moments and I guarantee it. If not, we can talk about it, but um, I, I think you're gonna find all of these moments. And then you're also gonna find these really common conventions. So always the rival, this links up with that idea of a, of a love triangle. Um, and this also often links up with the courtship the courtship romance. There's the third real character. One of them's usually also involved with the with the the lovers. Um, if you can say that the rival could be a, a, a personal ethic or some sort of outside opposing force, um, but most often it's a it's a person. And then you have your helpers and your harmers, the people who are really for the romance and helping the relationship and you know conspiring with the protagonist and those opposed to it. Here's um, Don John from Much Ado About Nothing, right? The, the folks who will do everything in their power to destroy this, this match. Uh, and there's an, usually an external need. This is something outside the romance that is driving the actions of the main characters. And you know, it could be creating a deadline. It could be um, a, a, a trip or there's something outside that is driving the plot forward and compelling the main characters to action. R romance stories are often morally loaded. Um, and in, um, in order for them to be happily ever after, they have to get over this moral failing. This is, I don't know that I, this is usually how this convention is expressed. I think you can also call it the internal conflict that they have to get over, they have to come to terms with. There's something um, within the, yeah, I, I guess moral, but it doesn't necessarily have to carry the, the weight of ide ideology with it, but it is something within the character that they have to get over by the story's end. Um, and opposing forces. These are separated out from the harmer because the opposing forces can be outside the character's control, like uh, family values or social rules. Um, it could also be something within the character's control, like a, a belief or a bad habit that they have to deal with. But there's usually a, a, another opposing force to the relationship outside of the physical character of a harmer, if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, there's rituals. Um, these are 
little moments of intimacy. It could be private language. It could be a shared inside joke. Um, in Pride and Prejudice, um, you know, they're, they're, they're like witty banter, their teasing is their ritual. And so you can think about what in my, in the story that I'm working on, what are the little things that they do together? And you're going to see that every really great romance has this, this um, shared intimacy between the lovers. And then secrets. And there's about four kinds of secrets. There's secrets that society keeps from the lovers. Um, you're related, you know, <laughs> but you know, something like that. Um, there's secrets that the couple keeps from society. So there's a secret relationship, um, whatever. There's the secrets that the couple keeps from each other. So this could be the rival, the, you know, the main protagonist is dating the rival as well and not telling the other love interest. Um, it could be a past, you know, a past sin if you're doing a mystery romance and you have a flawed detective in the center of it, they could have some sort of, of past sin that they've done, but typically there's some sort of secret. And it could even be secrets that the lover is um, keeping from themselves. So, or that they're not consciously aware of. So if we go back to Pride and Prejudice as our example, Darcy's pride, Elizabeth's prejudice would be these subconscious character flaws that they have to bring out into the open and realize and get over in order to have a successful relationship. And let's see, I think we're actually doing okay on timing here. Um, and so I really just wanna to touch quickly on intimacy. Um, typically, X-rated scenes are going to be an erotica or really specific subgenre work. Um, romance authors do tend to stay PG, especially if you're doing YA. It's maybe that's changing, but that's what you're going to see. And so there's these kind of classic substitutions that tend to be done. Um, right before the moment of intimacy, there's going to be the fade out. And I'll give you a good example of this next. Um, or other elements of intimacy take the place of, um, of anything erotic. So like very passionate kisses, very passionate touches. And I've included this photo here from the um, movie version of Pride and Prejudice where Darcy is holding um, Elizabeth's hand and it's this incredibly charged scene in the movie. And you know, as, as a viewer, you're just like, oh, you know, they touched and it, it carries all of the, the weight of, of true intimacy, even though it is literally just them holding hands. And so you can do that really successfully. And I have a few examples here. Um, so carrying with Pride and Prejudice as our kind of you know, um, standard example, this is a retelling of it by Curtis Sittenfeld. And um, it includes in one of the scenes a fade out. She unfastened and shrugged off her bra, which was her last remaining article of clothing and joined him in the bed. Five hours later, her plane landed in Cincinnati. So you see that just, it jumps, you know, and we, we know what happened. Um, and this is also nice because it really keeps the plot moving really quickly. Um, there's also other elements of intimacy taking the place of that eroticism. So their faces met and they kissed at such length that the kiss contained multiple phases, including the one in which they both were smiling, practically laughing, and the one in which she forgot where she was. So we're seeing that the depth of that kiss um, communicating to us, the reader, uh, the depth of the emotion and the attachment between the, the, the main characters. And then I'm including a little blurb from James Salter here. Um, this is just my personal opinion, which is that I, I think he's a fantastic writer. Um, and some of his work is a, more erotic. Um, I'm thinking of a sport in a pastime. Um, but I think he does such a good job at intimacy. Um, and he, he, he wouldn't be who I would, you know, there's other romance writers that I would recommend reading, but his, his language and his um, treatment of intimacy, I think is really worth looking at and learning from, at least it was for me. Um, and so this, this is a bit from Light Years. Um, he was moving unhurriedly like a man setting a table plate by plate. 
There are times when one is important and other, others when one almost does not exist. She felt him kneel, she could not see him. There was no movement, none at all, except for a slow distending to which she reacted as if to pain. She was rolling, sobbing, her shouts were muffled. He did nothing than more of it and more. So th there's nothing X-rated there, but it's it's so intimate and it is so, um, the strength of the writing is just wonderful. So I would recommend uh, checking him out if you're looking for inspiration. And I was hoping to save about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, maybe I hope that that's a right amount, um, but I do wanna end on a few resources. Um, and these are, these are books that really helped me um, and I would highly recommend. Um, so The Story Grid, What Good Editors, this is a book, What Good Editors Know by Sean Quinn. This is a book um, and they, it's become kind of this whole ecosystem where they do offer all kinds of services, editing services. Um, he's, really, he's really kind of taken an entrepreneurial stance, um, but I would just start with this book. It's a really great, um, a great place to start. And it's uh, an editor who worked on so many books and started seeing these patterns in what was successful and what wasn't and really does a good job of breaking it down structurally. Um, it can get into the weeds. And so you do need to know when to, when to pull back from this world, but it's a great book to start with. Um, kind of a classic is writing the breakout novel. The workbook that is included with this book is fantastic. The workbook um, gives you character prompts, um, writing, just plot prompts, um, it's a wonderful resource. And so it does come with a regular, you know, book that he talks about his experiences, but it's really the workbook that I would get my hands on and go through and use as you're fleshing out your own story. Um, Save the Cat is probably one that most of you have heard of. Um, it's a book on screenwriting, but the principles in it can be applied to a novel as well. And it's so helpful um, and, and pretty fun. And then I'm throwing in A Swim in a Pond in the Rain by George Saunders. Um, this is focused on short stories, but it doesn't matter. The, the, um, the teachings in it are going to be useful to you no matter what. And it's such an approachable book. Um, it is Russian. It, it's, it's Russian short, story, short stories that George Saunders then analyzes and breaks down so that you can see how they are put together structurally and why they're so successful and why they're so moving. And then you have some classics and I could go on and on a huge list here, but these are just a few. Um, again, many of you probably have heard these, but it's Bird by Bird, Writing Down the Bones, and then Stephen King's On Writing is just such a, such a wonderful book to read. So I was hoping to save time for Q&A and I hope I didn't go too fast, but, um, there's the presentation and um, I'd love to answer questions and, and chat about what you are all working on and see if there's anything, um, any other way I can be supportive. Fantastic, thank you, Margo. Um, there were a few questions in the chat, so why don't we start with those and then we can open it up further. You know, I think I have to stop screen sharing to see the chat. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. I'm sorry, folks. Yeah, this chat wasn't popping up for me. Okay. Um, I can read them to you. Mark has a question. Can romance be incorporated into a young adult book? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, again, the, the um, you know, if we go back to that, that first slide of um, what makes a romance, it's just is that central love story the going to be the access or the um, uh, the 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 thing that your whole story orbits around? And if that's your focus, then you know you've got a love story on your hands. Um, and YA romance is really popular, um, and there's some great ones on the market right now. Uh, Karen, did you want to ask your question? Do you want to turn your mic on and ask your question? Sure. Um, I'm just so impressed. At the beginning, you mentioned that you haven't studied, you don't have an MFA. 
Um, and so I was just wondering, how did you get the confidence to write? Like I see the list that you gave us of uh, books to read, uh, but is like, was there more resources that you used in order to get to that point? And then also I'd like to know, um, you did the, you wrote, you shared some stats on romance um, genre. I wondered where you got that because I'd love to get that for other genres. Um, so the, so the, the stats were from the Romance Writers Association, RWA, and they did a huge survey. Um, and that's why it, it's several years old. So we are seeing some shifts, but um, so I do trust those stats, but I don't know that they have done that for other genres because it's the Romance Association. Um, there should be, if you just dig around, there should be um, other stats, but are you curious about, is there something in particular that you're curious about? I'm just wondering if I might be able to. Uh, no, not necessarily, no. just maybe contemporary books or something like that. But I guess that's a huge, that might have a genre. Yeah. I mean, I would just research trends. Like it, it sounds like you're interested in just in, in what's happening in the market and in readership. Mm -hmm. I would just, you know, if you, if you research trends in the genre that you're most interested in, everyone's trying to figure it out all the time and so you should you should get some good hits from that um and yeah no i don't have an mfa and this is actually the first piece of creative writing i ever did um i did not write a short story i did not do any creative writing before doing this and so um i did not have confidence <laughs> i had zero confidence um i had confidence in my research because that's what my background is um and that's where i spent probably potentially too much time. Um, but I, 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 I had, and I still have confidence issues, right? And that's why I'm continuing to, um, you know, try to educate myself. And my, my suggestion, though, would be that if you feel compelled to be a writer, you're a writer, and, and that you have just as much, um, right to you know sorry right to that um as anyone else like you have you you deserve to be an author just as much as someone who was privileged enough to go to a fancy mfa program or you know um have a have a great degree or a pedigree so that would be my two cents on that this workshop was brilliant thank you so much Oh, I'm, I'm very happy it helped. And I'm also, you know, I'm always around if people have other questions or if there's a way I can um, offer any support. Uh, let's see. Yeah, James Salter, I do love James Salter. Um, character want and need. Uh, so, you know, I think it is, um, you know, I want coffee, I need water. You know, like it is, it is what are, what is, um, the, what is critical to the character's survival and then what is it that they, they, they truly desire. Um, and there can be conflict between those two and that can lead to a really interesting story. Um, um, I just wanted to point out that I put a couple resources in the chat that will help those of you who are looking for statistics or looking for um, expert commentary on the publishing industry, regardless of genre or on specific genres. Um, you should look at Publishers Weekly, which has a nice website, but they also have a print magazine, um, or at least they did pre-pandemic, uh, and then Booklist, uh, which is also in the chat, is a great way to keep tabs on the genre that you're looking for. Um, Emily had a question. Emily, do you want to turn your mic on? Sure. Yeah. Hey, this is so helpful. Thanks so much. And great to see everybody. Um, yeah. So I'm uh, actually a screenwriter and I'm writing a romantic dramedy uh, limited series with multiple couples. And so I was wondering any advice about like, if you don't have love triangles, but you just have multiple couples and like how many is too many or like kind of how to balance that. Hmm. That's really interesting. I mean, I feel like that's a whole long conversation over coffee, but um, I, I think it has to do with um, with your structure. Like, are you doing, you know, I think of the movies that came out where there were multiple couples um, 
what I'm forgetting the title. It was like Val it was Valentine's Day was mm. one of them and it was New Year's. I forget it was Yeah, there was like a New Year's, like so many different couples one. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's been recently a modern love one. Um and so I think the I would have a lot of questions around the, the how you want to structure that. Is it is it um each is it episodic where each episode focuses on a different relationship is it where there's some sort of um organizing structure for the group like i, I think of you're doing screenwriting so i'm trying to think of tv and stuff like i think yeah, of friends you. where it's you know we do see the love lives of different people or sex in the city like you know there's multiple love lives happening but there's the friendship core is is the organizing principle for mm -hmm. the story, um, and so I think I think figuring that out um, there ha it, it, there just would need to be some sort of of easy way for the viewer to organize what's happening so that mm -hmm. they can keep it clear, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll figure out pretty quickly. Oh, each episode is a new story, or oh, this is. We're, we're not just going to follow this friend, we're going to follow all of the, you know, all of the, the group. And I don't know enough about what you're working on or, or um, uh, the other details of it, but um, I don't know if that helped or not, or like in yeah, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Really right. yeah. like, love Actually, yeah. Love Actually is another one that I see people. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But yeah, and so I, I think, you know, and that actually brings up like the the thing that helped me so much was just, you know, looking at what was out, what was out there and what had been successful and how did they do it and, you know, grabbing they're all grabbing from Shakespeare, so <laughs> we can grab from them, right? So everyone's everyone's kind of borrowing, um, and and sort of the same with I see this other question about a female romantic lead who is deaf. Um, when I was working, I was constantly surprised at how much people wanted to share and to help. Um, my book, the main character in my book is a book restorer. And I reached out to book restorers and I asked, you know, tell me everything. What are the tools you use? What is this like? Let's take a deep dive into this world. And so if you're working on a female romantic lead, I would do interviews, you know, reach out. And there's, I'm sure that there are um, support groups on Facebook um, of people, you know, I, I'm, there have to be support groups of people who are in the process of losing their hearing, of people who are, um, you know, have always been deaf and, and living with deafness. Um, so I, I think people are, and representation matters so much. And so I love this idea. And I love that, you know, more people are being um, given love stories now because they deserve love stories. And so I just would say, make it really authentic and, um, and honest to the experience by reaching out and asking people. And, and I think you'll be surprised at how much people want to share. Thank you. Yeah. And great, great workshop today. It's been really okay. interesting and, um, and so helpful and practical as well. So thank you. I hope it helped. Um, I was trying to pack a lot in, so I hope I didn't talk too fast. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I had to dig around in the dark. And so the more I can just try to help other people who are working on it, not have to spend all that time, you know. Um, oh, and we also list, I know we're coming up on time. So um, Taryn did put some links here for other writing activities in the mailing list. Um, and they also have some upcoming classes. So if you wanna make sure that you're signed up, um, then you can stay in the loop. So um, I am on Instagram. That's probably where I am the most. And so if you think of questions um, after this and wanna reach out, feel free to shoot me a message and. Um, I'm always happy to to chat and um, I don't, does anyone have any, I know we're- I, I have one more question. Oh yeah. Um, I'm curious about you choosing this um, uh, antique book binding restoration <laughs> as this topic. Did you literally have note 
connection to that before and you had to learn from the ground up or did you take something that you'd already paid a certain amount of attention to i'm just wondering about this whole choosing a topic that you're familiar with versus uh just choosing something that you're completely unfamiliar with and then you have to start research from ground zero yeah um so for me personally um i the and and I should try to plug my book more and be a better marketer. But uh, the book focuses on a book restorer who's working through a palimpsest. And it's a treatise that has a document that's been scraped away and written over. And she's uncovering what that bottom layer says. It turns out to be a diary. And that's the vehicle by which we jump back to a historical love story. So it's a dual narrative, contemporary love story, historical love story. And that's kind of the structural uh framework there for me the the treatise was an actual treatise that i found and so i was doing um i was in grad school and i came across this treatise on art from the 1500s and it was wild it was so cool and i was just like i have to i have to learn about this and figure this out and then when i started uncovering the time period it was just i was like this is a story this is a book and it just wouldn't leave me alone and i had to write about it and so for me it was seeing that actual document, the physical thing. And then, but I'm not a book restorer and I, I, you know, I don't have a background in antiquities. So it was a lot of um, research. And so I think the thing there is just, is the thing that you're interested, is the thing that you're thinking about writing not leaving you alone? Is it just tapping on your shoulder all the time? And if it is, don't worry if it's not your background. You can research it and you can reach out. Again, I can't emphasize enough. People love talking about their jobs. If you're, you know, you're doing something in a field that's totally unrelated, then you reach out to someone who's doing it and they will tell you everything you need to know. People, you know, nobody gets to talk about their job and it's exciting for them and it's and it's fun. Um, and then, oh yeah, Faye, have you? People love reading about bookworms too. Like we love reading about ourselves. So <laughs> yes, I think, and you're gonna have, if you do something based in a bookshop, again, you're gonna have some built-in readers who just love reading about bookshops. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, people like talking about their worlds and they like reading about their worlds. So yeah, I think the biggest thing is just, is it, is it, is it something that is keeping you up at night? Cause that's gonna, be the the fuel that you need to keep going and keep working through it but don't be intimidated if it's outside of your your realm all right well thanks so much margo great content great conversation afterwards um, and thank you all for attending we aim to have the video of this event up on our youtube channel in a few days, um, and you'll receive an email from Eventbrite or from the Mechanics Institute via Eventbrite uh, with a link to that video and the pertinent uh, comments in the chat space. So thanks so much, and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank, thank you. For spending all right, thank together. you. Good oh. luck. You Good can job. do it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.